Good evening. Um, this, uh, this Hebrew announcement will be followed by an English one. Erev tov lekulam. Anachnu, ani samach meod liot po venase sicha ktsara vacharei agam shelot mikem ana yitazru besavlanut. So it's an honor to be here with you, and it was a very inspiring and mindful um, speech and talk that you just uh, gave. And just following that. Um, I want to have um, a few quick questions with you. Um, first of all, um, in October 2018, the IPPC uh, issued a report claiming that um, the, uh, the threshold of, of two degrees that you guys in Paris Agreement aimed for is, uh, is maybe... Uh, is maybe too risky, and even in 1.5, one and a half degrees um, more than in the industrial um, revolution, we might face a danger not longer than 2030. 2030. Um, where are we standing now in relation to the objective you set in Paris? And moreover, what are the implications of the decision by the Trump administration to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, given the huge uh, share, the huge portion of the U.S. in, in global carbon emissions? Thanks, Moab. Um, two very important questions. But um, I, I first want to oh, – oh, did she disappear? Um, that sand art was absolutely beautiful, wasn't it? <laughs> just gorgeous. Um, so to your important questions, um, first, what does the Paris Agreement say? The Paris Agreement says that uh, countries uh, will be at carbon neutrality by 2050, and that stands because that is what science has uh, has um, recommended, and the Paris Agreement is, is science-based and follows science. It also says that in order to be there by, uh, by 2050, that we actually have to start the reductions right away. You can see the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. You can measure them either according to uh, the um, intensity of carbon in the economy, which we have just gone through, or you can see it as a temperature. So there's two different ways of seeing it. The, with respect to the temperature, what the Paris Agreement says is that uh, countries agree that they will not allow the temperature to increase to a very fun temperature, which is called, and I quote, well below two degrees. You can tell that that was a political solution, uh, very creative uh, ambiguity there, uh, for the countries that felt that they needed more space. So there's well below two, uh, and strive to 1.5. So the Paris Agreement directions everybody to somewhere between 1.5 and well below 2. Well below 2 could be 1.9, 1.8, 1. we don't know. Um, that was the political um, agreement that was reached at that moment. Uh, you can imagine that we had countries that are heavy emitters. We have countries, 40 two countries that are small island states whose uh, survival depends actually on the reduction of emissions. So you have countries in many different um, spaces and obviously you have to find political agreements that very often are somewhat ambivalent. So the ambivalence in the Paris Agreement is somewhere between 1.5 and well below 2. Now, the other thing that the Paris Agreement did is it requested this report that you're talking about. The Paris Agreement legally mandated the IPCC to produce a report on the implications of 1.5 degrees because we didn't have that information in 2015. And in fact, when we told the scientists that we were thinking of injecting that into the Paris Agreement, they said, please don't do that because we don't have enough information. Well, we did it anyway because it was really important to very, very vulnerable countries. And hence, 
science will always continue to develop and give us more, um, more detail. But what we know now, as of October of last year, is that 1.5 has got to be the new north, not well below north and well below two. That flexibility that we thought we had between 1.5 and well below two, that flexibility is gone, sort of like the sand art, wipe it off. Um, we're now going to 1.5. And what is Astonishing to me is how many um, companies and investors and um, alliances, strategic alliances, have actually done exactly that. They have searched in their in their strategies two degrees or well below two, and they're going for 1.5 because they know that that has to be there. Who has not done that is well, <laughs> that too. But I was thinking of the U.S. actually. <laughs> <laughs> because Moab asked me about the United States. Well, there are some who argue that we are the 51st state. You know, well, it starts, we are the 51. I no, don't it's not me, I'm just... Okay. Um, I, I think uh, 1948 was a very hard one independence. I don't think we're going to give up on that one. Um, the... Um, sorry, one point... U.S., U.S., US. Oh, yeah. Who's that? Hmm. Um, so here's, here's the deal with him. The universe has a sense of humor, right? Uh, and I'm always, I'm always looking for those sense of humor. So here's the sense of humor about the United States. Given the legal clauses in the Paris Agreement, the first date that the United States could actually legally withdraw from the Paris Agreement is the 5th of November of 2020. The election of the United States is on the 3rd of November so of 2020. So who knows? Crystal ball, if any of you know whether he's going to be reelected or not, please do let me know so that I can start preparing emotionally. Um, <laughs> but you know we don't we don't know if there is another president that president could come back into the agreement with the sort of sweep of a sand art um if if he or she so chooses um and if he's reelected then we do have a problem right because the first 4 years has actually not been that much of a problem a because he hasn't been imitated by other countries and b because at least 55% of the us economy continues to decarbonize despite the white house or as i lovingly call it the dark house because there's no lights there um so they, the U.S. economy continues, 55% of the economy continues to decarbonize because they know it's good for them, because they want to be competitive. They don't want to be, you know, with the technologies of the 20th century when everybody is into the 21st century. Yeah, but they still fall very, very short from the objectives of Paris. We don't know that yet. We don't know that. Uh, the 26 to 28% reduction that the United States took on um, could be uh, could be delivered by the 15 states that uh, that have taken on on their own voluntarily the part the Paris um, targets and by the companies and the cities that are doing that we have more than 300 cities in the United States that are decarbonizing we have thousands of corporations we have 15 states obviously uh, California being the largest of them so we don't know honestly it's too early to know whether the United States, independently of the dark house, will actually be able to get to that 26 or 28 percent reduction or not. More importantly is actually the political message as it sent. Does it send a message that is an, uh, an, a paralyzing message to China, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and that's also very hard to tell. Because China could go in two directions. It could either say, well, since there's no lights over there in the dark house, we're not going to do anything. Because they have to do something by 2020 is the year in which all countries have to come back to the table and increase their emissions according to the, uh, their emission reductions according to the uh, Paris Agreement. So China next year could say, well, since the United States is not doing anything, we're not going to do anything either. Having fully complied with everything that they were going to say in Paris, they're actually way ahead of schedule. But they could say, mm, we're not going to, we're not going to, put any new uh, commitments on the table. Or China could say, fantastic, those people, they don't want to participate of the new economy, therefore we're going to go forward. 
because China is the number one investor in solar energy, the number one investor in wind energy, the number one investor in electric vehicles, and the number one investor in electric charging systems, um, and in batteries. And so, be why? Because they, not because they want to save the planet. No, no, no. That's not about it, right? They know that there is economic interest here. And they want to be in that, in the driver's seat with respect to where the global economy is going. Thank you. Um, you are very, I mean, you can feel, and everyone can feel your optimism. Um, and that evident? <laughs> But uh, you know, as a as a, as a journalist, I your job is to be pessimistic. No, I'm realistic. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> no, so there is kind of dissonance because I'm sitting here and I, I think, wow, we are going on the right direction, and then I wake up to the news every morning to 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 monitor the world and to report to my audience what's going on in the world, and every day seem seems to me worse than the day before because you see disasters, you see this report of the UN experts, not politicians, experts, last October saying that, wow, we are about to go in, into catastrophe if we are, not going to, we are not going to act now. So I want to ask you not about the philosophic, philosophic level or dimension, but about practical means, if you judge the line between Paris to uh, 2015 and now. The milestones, if there are milestones, the, the politicians, the, the countries, governments are going in the right direction, they, they, they take the right decisions, they implement the agreement in sort of way that, that we can say, okay, we are in the right direction. There is a fantastic word in Spanish, no, in German, sorry, in German that I don't know if it exists in Hebrew. It's both yes and no in the same word. Oh yo 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 Ken Velo Ken Velo Gam Vigam Okay does that mean both yes and no? Yeah Okay so that's my answer to your question Oh my Okay It's a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a journalistic nightmare We are working in black well, and white Sorry no 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 the world is definitely not black and white I am sorry the world is shades of grey Um so no, the world is not going in the right direction if you have a political lens on, okay? What, the, the way that I understand the reality that I see is I recognize it as being a, a bifurcated reality, a bifurcated reality. And both realities are true, and I hold them in equal standing. I don't hold one above the other. One reality is the political reality that you are um, talking about. And so, you know, there you have the dark house and you have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Brazil new president and you have the recent election in Australia. Um, and so you have, you know, pockets around the world of leaders who are, have not seen where we're going in the future and who are still holding on, anchored, you know, to past realities. That is a very, very important political reality that is there. I'm not diminishing it. It is definitely there. Period. New paragraph. The other reality is what the real economy is doing. And what the real economy is doing is actually being set by countries like China and India. So China, uh, as I just pointed out, is uh, absolutely front uh, in, this, uh, in this revolution because they want to export the things that you are all going to be importing. They want to export renewable energy. They want to export um, uh, electric vehicles. They want to export efficient digitalized technology because they know that that's where we're going. So China has actually already not just complied with what it said it was going to do in 2015, they've actually over complied. India, the same thing. So India put in uh, certain milestones that they would reach uh, by 2030. They actually will comply with those milestones by 2020. And so they are actually in a very good place 
to do what countries need to do next year, which is still a crystal ball reality, frankly. We don't know if they're going to do it. Because what the Paris Agreement says is that um, we knew that decarbonization was completely impossible for any country to commit to in 2015 because they had no idea how they were going to do it. They put it out there as their vision and their, you know, their, um, let's say their, their big goal, but they had no idea because we don't have the technologies yet to see how they were going to do it. But we encourage them all to bring their homework to the table, to say, right, so me, China, me, the United States, India, Brazil, Israel, Costa Rica, my country. Everybody go home, do your homework, and figure out what you can contribute to this global clause. And then come and put that result on the table. The collective effort of all of those countries, as registered in 2015, is completely insufficient to take us to 1.5. It's also completely insufficient to get us to 2050 with a carbon neutral economy. But we knew that. That was not a surprise. We knew that. And so what we actually decided was let, let, it is more important for all, everyone to get on to this process um, as opposed to insisting on perfection now. You know, sometimes perfection gets in the way of the good. And so we invited everyone to do their homework, bring it to the table, but then legally binding commitment that every five years they would come back, do their homework again, see where capital has shifted, what technology has done, uh, what policies they've implemented, and then be able to take a further, more ambitious commitment. That is due in 2020. The United States will not do it. Will China, India, and the other countries do it? I don't know. But if, if Brazil and Australia and the United States are not going to do it, it's not going to undermine the possibility to even reach the objective of Paris? No, because the objective of Paris is a long-term objective, okay? It, is, it will be measured in 2050. I plan to still be here. <laughs> it will be measured in 2050. And so, you know, if I had... Oh, excuse me, I'm going... To, can, I, can I use yeah. this? She's a multi-dimensional artist. Oh my God. You should be on TV. You want? I'm not going to be artistic. I'm just going to be practical. We've been going up and up and up. Thank you. Um, now, let's say that this is 2050, okay? So by 2050, we have to be, thank you, by 2050, we have to be back down here, which is basically carbon neutrality. Now, there are, more many different roads to this, okay? The safest road, the safest road, according to science, is that 2020 is here. This is 30, this is 40, and this is 50. So the safest road is to get to 2020 and then descend like this. Okay, that's one road. That's the safest road. Is it going to be possible? We don't know. But if we do that, then by 2030, this one means that by this time, we would be at one half the emissions that we are right now. So actually, sorry, I didn't do this right would be about here. So this is about half, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that, yeah, I'm practicing still. So that's the safest path. Now, there are other paths. Can, is... can it be done without, without the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest superpower in the world, the United States, being on board? Can it be done without the, administ the no, US administration be, be on the no, board? No, but, but I remind you that we have a 10-year span here. Okay? So it has to be done with the United States within these 10 years by the United States and China and India and everybody, okay? So those are the, t I think that's my alarm clock for the call. Um, the other path, there are many other paths. The other path, which is a dangerous path, is to continue here, mm -hmm. but then, you see, we would have to go down, still meet here, but this curve is a very, very difficult curve. This is the impossible curve. This is a possible curve. This one is very, very difficult. 
there is another path, there are many different paths, there's another path that says, you know what, we're actually going to what they call overshoot, which means go completely over and then come down. So, and I could put in many different paths here, okay? So the point is, there is not just one. To the point that it's not black and white, there are many grays. There are many paths. This is the recommended path by science. It is the path that gives us most economic stability um, and is the best path. Is so it politically no? speaking, this is the last, last minute we can afford Trump in the White House. <laughs> Just a second. You have 10 more minutes. You have 10 more minutes. She has 10 more minutes. Come on. Because you are in this uh, structure Excel kind of mind. You need to be free flowing. Okay, I am. Right. So. Do I make it hard for you here? Okay. Because this is my job. Um, you do your job, I do my job. Exactly. Um, but I envy you. You are, you are doing, I'm only telling stories about people who do. Uh, I don't know. I think. Oh, that's okay. Um, here is the thing. Um, don't we live in an evil magic circle? Which is the... What kind of a circle? Magic circle. A magic circle. But an evil one. Vicious. Oh, vicious. a vicious circle. Vicious okay, circle, okay, sorry. Okay, okay. So, because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the possibility to change course in the end of the day is in the end of the politicians, of policy makers, most of it, sometimes. And, and, just a second, just a second. And, of course, uh, let's see Trump, right? Trump could change course, and he decided to remain in the course of fossil fuel and coal, but... In order to change it, the, one, the, the people who are going to be hurt, who are going to lose, are either his con constituencies or huge international um, energy corporations. And usually, the politicians have no interest to change course because it's either going to hurt their voters or these huge corporations, which are sometimes their career depends on. How can you break this vicious circle? How can you break this, this you know? I think, yeah, yeah, no, I understand your point, but I think it's actually already being broken. So let me use the United States as our favorite example tonight. Um, be, for whatever reasons, right? We, we, we can go into that later if you want, but for whatever reasons, um, Donald Trump decided that he wanted to, you know, have this war against climate change. Fine. Uh, now, what it's is... Be the it's because he wanted to be re-elected and he needs these guys in the coal mines in West Virginia and Pennsylvania who depends on coal. It's not, also, it's let also me give you an, because let me, let me, let it's also because he got huge donations from fossil exactly, fuel Exactly, that's what I said. His voters, and, voters and donations by these energy corporations. Okay, okay. So... Um, so that was the reality whenever he was, um, whenever he was elected. Now, um, he has tried to uh, pull back, claw back, many of the regulations that were put in place in the United States to decarbonize the economy. The fact is none of those attempts, although he puts his big huge signature on all of these things, um, none of those have actually been uh, successful because there are so many legal suits against those attempts. So none of them have actually gone into effect. Um, he, of course, you know, does a huge press conference and a lot of tralala -la and, you know, gets a lot of attention from the press um, and from us. Um, but the fact is that, you know, he hasn't been able to take them into effect because the economy, and we're back here into the bifurcated reality, the economy understands that they're better off moving forward. My latest pet, pet example, he, one of the th last things that he um, invented one three o'clock in the morning was um, that he was going to roll back emission uh, standards for vehicles. 
Um, and so he got into this huge fight with California because California, the independent republic of California, um, decided they have the best fuel efficiency standards in the United States and they want to keep them because they're actually being really affected by climate change and they don't want to be a part of the problem. They want to be a part of the solution. So, um, so they got into this legal fight that is still ongoing, but he insisted that he really wanted to roll back even further. What happened? 17 of the 20 large manufacturing companies of cars in the United States, the CEOs of those 17 companies, wrote a letter to Trump saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Because Don't they want roll. to remain equal with the other states, not because they want to, you know, to reduce, to cut emissions. No, 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 no. They're doing it. No, no, no. This, this has nothing to do with greenhouse, you know, gases. It has nothing to do with environment. It is surely an economic argument. The car manufacturers say, whoa, 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 whoa. It is completely uneconomical and unviable for us to produce two different types of cars. Am I going to produce one car for California and another one for Ohio? That makes absolutely no sense. And so they said, don't roll that back because we have to have one production line. We have to be able to be efficient in our, in our production uh, because we're competing against all of the other uh, countries that are trying to get um, the U.S. market. So, so they, it is surely an economic argument, right? This is not about saving the planet. This is not about, I don't know, environmental, da, da, da. no. It is surely an economic argument that makes sense. Those who are seeing where the world is going, and that is not questionable. The world is definitely moving toward, uh, toward decarbonization. Those who see that would rather prepare for that world rather than keep themselves anchored in the world of the past. Last question because we really need to finish. Um, can you give us, um, I would say, a clue or an advice what every one of us can do. Yeah, but not in terms of, uh, you know, throw your SUV away or go uh, with your... Uh, I with have your five things. Hmm? I have five things that everybody can do. <laughs> Number one. We, we, we did not talk before. It's <laughs> Number one. If you're still eating red meat seven days a week, you're not doing yourselves a favor. You're actually doing your body harm. And it's just not good for your body, right? So I don't mean that you have to go from seven days to zero overnight. But that should be your target. And you can start from the seven days to six to five to four, etc. You're doing yourselves a huge favor. You're also doing something important for the planet. Sorry? Transport. Number two. Number two, if you're transporting yourselves with a huge, you know, fossil fuel burning thing um, that has four wheels, and particularly if you're transporting yourself individually, you're not doing yourselves a favor. A, it's not good for your health either because you should do more exercise. Um, but it's also not good for the health of the planet. So, you know, share rides, walk more, use the little electric... What do they call those lime things? Scooters, use your bicycle. I mean, you know, get out there and get more exercise because you'll live longer. And so will the planet. Um, number three. Uh, for those of uh, you who uh, live in air-conditioned homes, make sure that your home is properly insulated. Because if it's not properly insulated, you are cooling the entire neighborhood, let alone the entire city, unnecessarily. It's bad for your wallet, and it's bad for the planet. So make sure that you're insulated properly. Number four, if you are in the um, age group that has some disposable cash, make sure, and you have investments and savings, make sure that those investments are not in high carbon assets, certainly not in coal, because you'll lose your money. Okay, so it's not good for your old age security, financial security. It's also not good for the planet. And finally, those of us who have the privilege of living in democracies, vote with your head. Thank you so much, Christiana Figueres.